Bruce. We're just doing one song and then you're coming up and then we'll do the others. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Armona Baptist Church Facebook Live. Uh, it's good to be back in the building. Um, praying that everybody is staying safe, everybody is staying healthy, and we look forward to uh, hopefully meeting with everybody here in the next few weeks or as soon as we possibly can. In the meantime, praying for uh, blessings and health and uh, just uh, everything that you need in this time. I'm going to go ahead and open us in prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for uh, <laughs> this time uh, that we're going through. Uh, we know that uh, uh, it may be a storm. Uh, it may uh, be a, a season, but uh, we know that you're already at the end of it, already in the middle of it. Uh, you're, you're there with us on a daily basis. Uh, and uh, we thank you for your guidance, your comfort, and your blessings. Just continue to keep us all safe. Continue to be with those of us that are uh, out there working, all the essential people, the essential workers, uh, um, just uh, continue to keep your hands of protection on everybody around the world, Lord. All these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Our opening hymn is, Know How He Loves You and Me. soon. Matter of fact, uh, church council and deacons met this morning to really talk about how to go about doing that. And right now what we're looking at is kind of a phased restarting. Next week we're going to kind of be like this, just a few of us here. And then the last Sunday in May, we're going to be inviting everyone to come back except those who are maybe the most at risk. Uh, so families and kids, you're going to be welcome on I believe it's May 31st uh, to be back with us. Uh, we, we're doing all that we can. We're asking all the questions of how we can do this safely. And then hopefully if as things go and you know, as we believe they're going to go, then we're inviting everybody, even those that are most at risk, to be with us on June the 7th. And so it's certainly great. I, I would make other announcements. There are announcements uh, posted on Facebook. Uh, about the church, but I'm not going to take time uh, to go over those this morning. I, again, I just want to say with Brother Bill, it's so good to be back with you. Uh, happy to uh, have this opportunity to be back in the building after uh, doing it out of my sunroom for like six weeks or so. Uh, it's certainly uh, good to be back with you. We're going to sing a couple of more, and then uh, we're going to preach. So come back, Bill. <coughs> God will take care of you. Yeah. 
Today and as I said earlier, hopefully uh, we'll be able to invite everybody back on June 7th. Uh, so be looking for a letter in the mail. Uh, 
on the, whether at the end of this week or beginning of next week, explaining uh, what we're doing, how we're phasing back in uh, to worship, but also explaining some of what we're doing as far as trying to do this as safely as we possibly can uh, about the social distancing and things that we need to keep in place. So be looking for that later. Also, uh, be praying for one another. Uh, it's been difficult uh, these last few months for everyone and very discouraging uh, for some. You know, Satan wages warfare against God's people through doubt and fear and discouragement, depression, and the upheaval in work life, in school life, family life, and church life. It's impacted and affected all of us. And the news messes with our minds, doesn't it? Oh, states and businesses are opening back up. Woohoo! But you're opening up too soon and you shouldn't do it yet. Oh no! I mean, it's just this back and, and forth sort of stuff that's going on. Who do we believe? What do we believe? And so we're having to ask a lot of questions. Questions that we've uh, never even thought about asking before. Uh, we've been asking a lot of, when it comes to gathering together again, uh, we, we were asking a lot of questions of one another this morning. Lots of questions. How can we do this safely? Should we wear a mask? As you see, I have my, my mask. But should we wear a mask? Can we sing? Uh, how are we going to see people? How are we going to receive an offering? How are we going to do the Lord's Supper? How are we going to do invitation? How are we going to do greeting? Uh, are we be asking, I'm sure there will be more questions we'll be asking as we move more into this process of coming back together. As things come up that maybe we've not even thought even think about and on top of this some of you are dealing with personal challenges that are unrelated at all to the COVID virus health issues have nothing to do with COVID maybe relationship issues and so often the question rises up in our hearts why when life doesn't make sense or when God seems unfair we ask questions we may not voice them uh, but they rise up within us and we ask them within ourselves. So what I want to do for the next few Sundays, here's kind of what I envision doing uh, next few Sundays. We're going to be looking at the book of Habakkuk. Habakkuk. Uh, and we're going to just be kind of going on a journey with this prophet as he moves from uh, doubts and questions to a, a place of rejoicing and embracing who God is and what God's going to do. I want to do that for the next three Sundays. And then that would bring us to June 7th. And June 7th, hopefully, is when we'll all be able to come back together. And that's just going to be a celebration. We're just going to celebrate getting to be back together again uh, as the church here at Armona Baptist Church. Uh, but <clears throat> back in January, I uh, preached the book of Jonah. Jonah's one of the minor prophets. Oh, everybody's heard of Jonah. But who's heard of Habakkuk? <laughs> That's in the Bible? Yeah, it's, it's a book in the Bible. It's a little book, uh, only three chapters long. But uh, Habakkuk asked some very important questions. Actually, I think he asked questions that all of us ask at one time or another. We all ask these questions. And uh, he is in the middle of a mess. Don't know much about Habakkuk. Uh, we really don't. But he's in a mess and he was agonizing and he's asking questions and verse 1 is the oracle that Habakkuk the prophet received and the word oracle means burden and some translations will have the burden and Habakkuk was carrying a burden but the neat thing about Habakkuk is he takes his burden to the Lord uh, I think eventually he leaves it there but he takes his burden uh, to the Lord. So let me give you the context before we look at the scripture itself. Uh, the, the ten tribes of northern of the northern kingdom, Israel, they don't even exist any longer. Uh, they were conquered by Assyria. God used that Assyria. Uh, the northern tribes have become so ungodly, worshiping false idols, refused to turn to God. And so God used the cruel nation of Assyria to conquer and enslave them. 
But Habakkuk was a prophet in the southern kingdom, which was comprised of the two tribes of Judah and Benjamin. And it's where Jerusalem was located within the, uh, the nation of Judah. And um, in the early years uh, for uh, Habakkuk, uh, it was just a great time in the life of Judah. Uh, and that was one of the reasons why was because Josiah became king. And Josiah became king when he was eight years old. But he had great <clears throat> spiritual advisors who guided him. And at the age of 16, he began to put in place some very important religious reforms. One thing, he repaired the temple. And revival kind of swept over the nation. And so it was kind of a, maybe you could say a golden age for them for, for several years or during the reign of Josiah. But when Josiah died, things changed. And as we know, things can change suddenly. Uh, Josiah's son, Jehoiakim, became the king, and he wasn't like his father. He was ungodly, and he was rebellious. And people often follow the example of leadership. And so the, uh, the way that jo Jehoiakim went, well, that's the way the people went. And this really bothered Habakkuk. This spiritual turnaround, reversal, really weighed upon his heart. It was a burden, <clears throat> burden to him. And it's interesting that the name Habakkuk means to wrestle or to embrace. Uh, and that makes sense when you think about it, because if you're wrestling with somebody, you have to embrace them to do that. You know, If we could do this social distancing, I'd have people come up here and we'd wrestle just to show you <laughs> how we, we're embracing while we're wrestling. Uh, so it, it makes sense uh, that it means both things. And this is what we see Habakkuk doing. He wrestles with God to understand what's occurring. Why is God doing what he's doing? But at the same time, he embraces God, even when he doesn't understand. Have you ever experienced that? You've wrestled with God, you don't understand. You're... But at the same time, because of faith, you embrace him. And that's what we see happening uh, in the life of this prophet. Well, in chapter 1, Habakkuk asks, three complaining questions. Now, as I mentioned, Habakkuk has faith in God or he wouldn't have come to God with the questions, but it's a sorrowing faith. It's a sighing faith that has a heavy heart as he attempts to reconcile what he believes about God with what he sees that's happening all around him. So three questions that he asks, and I think these are questions that all of us ask at one time or another. And I'm not going to read all of chapter 1, but chapter 1 is really the focus for today because what we're going to do is this Sunday chapter 1, next Sunday chapter 2, the next Sunday chapter 3. But I want to read the first uh, six verses of Habakkuk 1. The oracle that Habakkuk the prophet received, How long, O Lord, must I call for help? But you do not listen or cry out to you violence, but you do not save. Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrong, destruction, and violence are before me? There is strife and conflict abounds. Therefore the law is paralyzed, and justice never prevails. The wicked hem in the righteous, so that justice is perverted. Look at the nation. This is the Lord now starts to answer him. Look at the nations and watch and be utterly amazed. For I am going to do something in your days that you would not believe even if you were told. I am raising up the Babylonians, that ruthless and impetuous people who sweep across the whole earth to seize dwelling places, not their own. Let's pray. Father, I just come to you again at this time. and Thank you once more uh, for the opportunity for to be here uh, in this physical structure we call the church, this the gathering place of our Mona Baptist Church where we've not been able to gather. And that's been tough. That's been difficult for many of us. Uh, this is, uh, uh, in many ways, we look to it as home. And we've really missed getting to be at home and especially getting to be here with God's people. So I'm grateful, Father, that we can be back 
here in this limited way this morning. And we look forward to being back in a fuller way in weeks to come. But Lord, I believe that all of us have asked in the last several weeks these very same questions. Maybe we've not verbally voiced them, but they have arisen in our hearts, these questions that Habakkuk asked. And Father, I pray that even though we maybe have been wrestling with you, trying to understand that we will be like Habakkuk and we'll, we'll embrace you by faith at the same time. For I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I want us to look at these three questions that Habakkuk asked. And um, I think that you'll agree in one form or another you have asked, if not the same question, similar question. The first question is this, God, do you care about us? God, do you care about us? There in verse 2, how long, O Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen or cry out to you violence, but you do not save? You know, sometimes it, it seems God doesn't care. I mean, let's just be honest. Uh, we see what's going on around us, and it's like, God, don't you care? Uh, don't you love us? Uh, how long must I cry out for you to help? Now, when Habakkuk's speaking here, he's really speaking about what's going on in his nation at this point. He's burdened uh, of the rampant sin and the blatant uh, disrespect that they're showing for God and God's will and God's law. And he looks at that sin and he looks at that violence and he says, God, don't you care? I've been crying out for you to help us. Help us. But you don't save us. Don't you care about me? Don't you care about my world? Don't you care about my problems? I believe there are those who have been asking that during that pandemic. And the pandemic we're going through. We see those numbers going up and we hear about more and more dying. And, and it's God, don't, don't you care about us? Well, the answer is yes. The answer is yes. How do we know the answer to that yes? Well, we know it because God's word promises it. We just sang about it a little earlier in the song. God will take care of you. 1 Peter 5, 7. Cast all your anxiety, all your cares on him because he cares for you. God's word promises that he cares about us. Um, also, God's word proves it through God's sacrifice. God's sacrifice proves it. Romans 5 eight. but God proves his love for us in this. That while we were still sinners, Christ did what? God. Died for us. He died for us. You don't ever have to wonder about the love of God. All you have to do is look at the cross. I don't know how many times I've said that throughout the years, but I believe it's so true. Whenever you begin to wonder, does God love me? Just look at the cross. God loves us. And sometimes that's hard for us to believe. You know, it, it's hard to believe that God, this great big universe loves us. I'm, who am I? I'm so insignificant. So it kind of reminds me of a Peanuts cartoon strip. Sally does something unusual. She says, Charlie Brown, I love you. Charlie Brown says, no, you don't. And each time Sally answers a little louder, yes, I do. I really love you, Charlie Brown. But Charlie just keeps saying, no, you don't. It can't be true. It can't be true. So in the last frame, Sally reaches her limit of patience and she screams out, hey, stupid, I love you. <laughs> well, the cross is God's way of shouting, hey, I love you so much that I'd rather die than be without you. God loves us. And some of you may have been asking, does God care? Does God love me? We look at what's going on around us, and the answer is yes. Yes, he does. God loves us. Question two, two is this. God, are you at work around us? I know a lot of you here at Armona, you've taken the, gone through the study experiencing God. And I believe it maybe it's the first reality, is that God is always at work around us. Even when we're not aware of it, even when we don't see it, even when we don't perceive it, God is always at work. Verse 3, why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. There's strife and conflict abounds. And sometimes it just seems like God just allows evil to abound. And, and Habakkuk doesn't understand God's inaction. 
God, are, are, are you even at work? Are you doing anything about this situation uh, that we're in? Justice is being perverted. A people that are supposed to be holy and spiritually aware and mature, they're not. Instead, they're backslidden and they're faithless. They ignore your law, God, and, and it just seems like you're just tolerating it. Are you doing anything about this? Are you even doing anything? Are you at work around us? And God gives an answer. And the answer is yes. Yes, I am at work. But we need to know God's answer is not always the one we expect. Usually when we ask the question, we have something in mind that we think he should be doing and how it should be being done. And God doesn't always answer that way. Matter of fact, in verses 5 and 6, God speaks. And he says, look at the nations and watch and be utterly amazed for I'm going to do something in your days that you would not believe even if you were told. I'm raising up the Babylonians, that ruthless and impetuous people who sweep across the whole earth to seize dwelling places not their own. And in verses 7 through 11, God continues to describe how powerful and violent this nation is. And what he is saying to Habakkuk is Babylon is going to come on Judah as Syria came upon the nations of Israel, or the ten tribes of Israel. That was not the answer Habakkuk was expecting. That was not the answer that Habakkuk wanted. God is always at work around us, but we may not understand how he is at work, and God does not always provide an explanation either. We'll read verses 10 and 11. It says, they deride kings and scoff at rulers. They laugh at all fortified cities. They build earthen ramps and capture them. Then they sweep past like the wind and go on. Guilty men whose own strength is their God. God tells Habakkuk what he's going to do, but not why he's going to do it the way he's going to do it. He's going to do it, but he doesn't say why he's doing it the way he is. He informs Habakkuk, though, I'm in charge and I'm in control. I'm at work and I'm in charge and I'm working it. I'm going to do it my way. Judah is going to be judged and the instrument of judgment will be the Babylonians. Now, Habakkuk had been concerned about what God was not doing. And now he becomes more concerned about what God's going to do. You know, it's kind of uh, surprising how a new problem can take your focus off of an old problem, isn't it? And you start thinking about this instead of that, and that's what happens with Habakkuk. He, he stops being concerned about Judah, and he becomes concerned about what God is going to do and how he's going to do it. God's always at work around us, often in ways we don't expect. And he does not always explain his reasoning for doing what he's doing. And so you may be questioning if God is at work in what's occurring with this pandemic? And the answer is yes. God is at work. He's at work all around us. Mm -hmm. I think we probably don't yet understand why. Um, I've heard some possible whys uh, from different folks, uh, from some pastors and from others. God's calling his people to repentance. And I could agree with that. God often uses struggles and difficulties in our lives to call to the church to repent and to, and to return to Him so that He can return to us. Some have said this is God's judgment upon the sinful world, that God is using this pandemic as He used Babylon against Judah. I, don't, I can't say that that's what's occurring. I don't know. It's possible that God is doing that. Others have asked me if I think this is a part of end time prophecy coming about. Uh, one said that is God setting the stage for the one world government because this pandemic isn't affecting just the United States. It's affecting every nation and governments are asking or demanding their people do certain things and is this possibly uh, the beginning of a one world government? And my answer to that is I don't know. I don't know if that's what God is doing through this or not. I don't really know why 
God is allowing this to occur. But I do know that he is at work in the midst of all of this. I think in time we'll be able to perceive more than we understand now. Uh, but we are going to see how God is at work in, in ways. But that leads us maybe to the third question. Well, God, if you're at work, do you know what you're doing? Um, I recognize you're at work, but do you really, do you know what you're doing? Um, let me read verse 13 to you. Your eyes are too pure. This is, again, this is about speaking to God. Your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrong. Why then do you tolerate the treacherous? Why are you silent while the wicked swallow up those more righteous than themselves? So Habakkuk is looking at, God said, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to send the Babylonians uh, to Judah to judge Judah and Habakkuk says, why would you do that, God? Do you know what you're doing? Habakkuk's really very confused. How can God judge us with people who are more sinful than we are? How, Lord, can you do that? Now, he had been complaining about the Jews. Now he sees them as helpless in face of the Babylonians. Babylonians would conquer people after people, country after country. And not only that, they were arrogant and vicious and proud and fierce and ruthless and cruel. God, how could you use something so wicked as an instrument to exact justice? Lord, do you know what you're doing? And the answer is yes. God knows what he's doing. We have to recognize that the way God works can be confusing to us. And why is that so? It's so because God is God and we're not God. That's really, uh, he's awesome and he's infinite and he knows all things and we don't. And so when he is at work and we're trying to figure out what he's doing, it, it can be confusing to us because as we're told in Isaiah 55, God says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than, than your thoughts. In other words, we can't see from God's perspective. God sees the total picture. He, he sees the end from the beginning he, and everything in between. There's nothing hidden from him. He's all seeing and he's all knowing. And we don't have that eternal perspective. And so it can be very confusing to us. So, so what should we do when we are confused? We'll begin with what you know. There are some things that we do know. So we begin with what we know. And that's what Habakkuk does. In verse 12 it says, O Lord, are you not from everlasting? My God, my Holy One, we will not die. O Lord, you have appointed them to execute judgment. O rock. You have ordained them to punish. What Habakkuk does is he looks to the rock of his salvation. You know, if you're walking through the midst of a storm, what are you looking for? What do you look down to find? You look that place of sure footing. You look for the rock. You don't look for the mud and the slime. You're looking for the rock. And so Habakkuk is confused. And so what does he do? He looks to the rock. He looks to what he knows about God and that is unchanging, the unchanging truth about God. He knows that God is eternal and he sees the beginning uh, or the end from the beginning. And therefore, he knows that God is not taken by surprise. God never goes, uh-oh, or never says, hmm, I didn't think about that. Uh, he always knows he knows that God is holy and pure. And therefore he knows that God never approves and cannot approve of sin. And so Habakkuk asks God, is this consistent? Is this consistent? Do, do you know what you're doing? I know that you're holy. I know that you're pure. So I don't understand. So Habakkuk just didn't understand. So what do you do when you don't understand? Well, here's what I believe you do. And this is what Habakkuk does. You wait on God when you don't understand Him. 
You trust him and you wait on him. Amen. Verse 1 of chapter 2, Habakkuk says, I will stand at my watch and station myself on the ramparts. I will look to see what he will say to me and what answer I am to give to this complaint. So Habakkuk says, I'm going to wait on the Lord. I'm going to wait. I don't understand. This is confusing. It doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't seem consistent with what I know about God. But I trust Him. He's eternal God. And I'm going to wait on Him. What is this pandemic about? I mean, it's not like we can't think about it. It's in front of our noses every day. You know, what's this all about? And the answer is, we don't know. We may have some ideas, we may, we may have some thoughts about it, but we don't know. But what do we know? We know God cares about us. We know God loves us. We know this. We know that God is at work in ways that we don't always discern, that we don't always comprehend. And we know that God knows what he's doing. God knows what he's doing. You see, a Habakkuk had faith. Habakkuk had faith in God. And let's, let's admit it. You know, we don't lean on our faith when everything's going great. Uh, it's when struggles and difficulty and heartache and sorrow come, trouble come, uh, that our faith grows. That's when we really, even though we may be wrestling with God, that's when we really embrace Him. And we hold on tight. But the wonderful thing is, He's holding on to us. It's not that we're holding on to Him. He is holding on to us. So when those why God, why questions rush from your heart, I just want to encourage you to wait on God. Trust the eternal God who knows the end from the beginning, who is above and beyond our thoughts and our ways, who has proven that he loves us by the giving of his own son on the cross. And you wait and you trust. And you find that he's worth waiting for. He is the God who's worth waiting for. Habakkuk asked the questions that we all ask. He wrestled with God. And you may be wrestling with God. I want to encourage you to embrace him by faith at the same time. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we come before you right now. We, we again, we want to thank you for your word. We thank you for the truths that we read even in the first chapter of Habakkuk as he is wrestling with God. And we acknowledge that we ask these questions, not just in this pandemic, but in different times of our lives, uh, different reasons. Uh, these same questions come to our heart, hearts. God, don't you care about us? God, or are you doing anything about it? Do you know what you're doing? And Lord, not just in Habakkuk, but consistently throughout your word, the answer is yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes, yes. You love us. You're working through circumstances to bring good for those who love you. And you certainly know what you're doing. It may be that there's someone here in this building this morning or someone who is watching uh, through Facebook Live who's really been wrestling. I pray, Father, that like Habakkuk, they would wait, trust you, Lord, and wait for the answer and to know that you're the God worth waiting for. It may be that there's some watching who realize that they need to trust Jesus as their Savior, as their Lord. I pray, Father, that they would repent of their sin and place their faith in Christ and be saved, become a child of God. Others may need to recommit their lives uh, to the Lord. Truly, I believe God is calling the church to repent, to return to their first love, to return to the Lord so he can return to us. If that's God's call on your heart today, I pray that you would do that. Return to the Lord. Turn from your sin. Recommit your life to him anew and afresh this day. It may be that the Lord's even speaking to you about joining this church. You say, well, how am I going to do that? Uh, church isn't even meeting. 
Well, you can let us know that that's your desire. When we do meet together again, we'd love to welcome you as a part of the family here at Armona Baptist Church. Lord, it's been good just to be here with you uh, in this way today. We've been with you at, in our homes, uh, worshiping, family worship, worshiping uh, through Facebook Live. It's good to be able to worship with some of your people uh, today. And we look forward when we can gather together more fully. Until that time, Lord, we ask you to watch over, keep people safe, keep them healthy, and bring them back here soon. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it's been good worshiping with you here in this building today, but also you uh, on Facebook. I would encourage you again to share this to your page. As I've said week after week, you never know who the Lord may have to watch this and who it might reach. It might be just the message that they are in need of hearing. So please share that. And we'll be back here in the building again next Sunday, uh, meeting this way. And then the next Sunday, you all... Many of you will be welcome to be back with us. Be looking for that letter in the mail uh, that we'll be getting this week or the next. So for now, God be with you till we meet again.